Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson? Present. Assemblywoman Black? Assemblywoman Brown May? Here. Assemblywoman Carlton? Here. Assemblywoman Cohen? Here. Assemblyman Ellison? Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Here. Assemblywoman Hansen? Here. Assemblywoman Martinez? Assemblywoman Titus? Here. Assemblyman Wheeler? Chair Watts. Here. Thank you. Please mark Assemblywoman Martinez and Assemblywoman Black present as they arrive. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us in person today. As a reminder, the legislative building is now open at limited capacity. In order to participate either in person via Zoom or by phone, you must register on Nellis from the legislative website and follow the related instructions. Uh, Let's see, a few other housekeeping items. Um, written comments, if you're unable to participate during our meeting, can be emailed to our committee email address before, during, or up to 48 hours after a meeting. Committee exhibits or amendments must be submitted electronically as a PDF to our committee manager no later than 4 p.m. the day prior to the meeting. All exhibits that are submitted can be found on the Nevada Legislature's website. We will be asking uh, that anybody wishing to provide public comment or testimony limit their comments to two minutes so that we can accommodate all speakers and get through the agenda in a timely manner. Speakers are also urged to avoid repetition of comments made previously. It's okay to just say ditto. Uh, also, we do have three bills on the agenda today. And so I will say at the outset that I'm planning to limit testimony in support, opposition and neutral for each bill to a total of 20 minutes uh, for each position. So uh, with that, members, let's go ahead and get started. We have three uh, measures uh, on the agenda today, and we will start with SB 404, which revises provisions governing cannabis. Uh, with that, I believe we have uh, Ms. Matijevic with us by Zoom. I'll open the hearing on SB 404, uh, Ms. Matijevic, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Watson, members of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. For the record, my name is Cadence Matijevic, and I have the privilege of serving as Administrator for the Division of Consumer Equitability at the Nevada Department of Agriculture. Thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 404 to you today. My presentation will be based on the mock-up prepared for your committee by the LCB Legal Division, which I believe has been posted to Nellis. This bill seeks to resolve what has been an ongoing issue over the last several years regarding licensing, inspection, and testing of certain weighing and measuring devices used in cannabis establishments in Nevada. Existing law requires that all weighing and measuring devices used for a commercial purpose in Nevada be licensed as commercial weighing and measuring equipment and charges the state sealer of consumer equitability with the duty to inspect and test all licensed commercial weighing and measuring equipment. NRS 581.0025 defines commercial weighing and measuring equipment to mean weights and measures and weighing and measuring devices used commercially in establishing the size, quantity, extent, area, or measurement of quantities, things, produce, or articles for distribution or consumption, purchase, offer, or submission for sale, hire, or award, or computing any basic charge or payment for which for services rendered on the basis of weight or measure. Many of the weighing and measuring devices currently in use in cannabis establishments clearly meet the definition of commercial weighing and measuring equipment. Those devices are currently licensed by the Division of Consumer Equitability and are routinely inspected and tested by our weights and measures inspectors. What this bill seeks to address is the licensing, inspection, and testing of those weighing and measuring devices used in cannabis establishments, which do not meet the definition of commercial weighing and measuring equipment. These devices are typically used by cannabis establishments for inventory, per inventory management purposes, excuse me, and to comply with certain regulations of the Nevada Cannabis Compliance Board, including determining weight and measurement values entered into the seed to sale tracking system used to monitor the chain of custody of cannabis from the point of acquisition or planting to the end consumer. 
While the state sealer of consumer equitability may not necessarily have an interest in ensuring non-commercial devices used for these inventory management and chain of custody purposes are suitable for their intended use, properly installed, maintained, and accurate, the Nevada C Cannabis Compliance Board and other regulatory agencies appear to have a keen interest in doing so. This interest from other regulatory bodies and agencies has created confusion and frustration for many cannabis establishment operators as they have received conflicting direction from enforcement personnel as to which of the devices in the cannabis establishment are and are not considered to be used for commercial purposes and therefore subject to licensing testing and inspection by the Division of Consumer Equitability. The Division of Consumer Equitability has, he has held a number of educational sessions to try to address this confusion and conflicting direction, but have found that with staff turnover both in industry and at regulatory agencies, this continues to be an issue. To their credit, many cannabis establishment operators will request that the Division of Consumer Equitability perform special inspection and testing of their non-commercial devices just to have something on hand to present to enforcement personnel from other agencies to try to demonstrate their diligence and compliance. It's worth noting that the Division of Consumer Equitability's fees for inspection of non-commercial devices are higher than the annual license fees for commercial devices. So while this bill would increase the number of devices which are subject to licensing and therefore the number of devices subject to licensing fees, we believe that the overall cost to industry related to inspection and testing of weighing and measuring devices by the Division of Consumer Equitability may actually go down if this bill were to be passed. This is because cannabis establishments would no longer have the need to request special inspection of devices under our non-commercial fee schedule and could avoid paying fees which they are currently subject to for special inspection trips when they decide to begin using a non-commercial device for a commercial purpose. Admittedly, this bill would also provide efficiency benefits for the Division of Consumer Equitability, as we believe it will reduce the number of repeat trips to canna cannabis establishments to inspect devices based on their use for non-commercial purposes being changed to use for commercial purposes. The language which is proposed to be added by amendment, notated in green bold underlining in the mock-up document, is intended to address concerns raised by industry representatives regarding applicability of the bill to weighing and measuring devices used in cannabis independent testing laboratories. The language added in the mock-up would exempt such facilities from the requirements of the bill pertaining to licensing, inspection, testing, and sealing of cannabis weighing and measuring equipment. NRS 278B.290 and Cannabis Compliance Board Regulation 11.020 requires that cannabis independent testing laboratories obtain accreditation pursuant to standard ISO I IEC 17025 of the International Organization for Standardization within one year after licensure. As a component of that accreditation process, the facilities would need to demonstrate to the accreditation body that the weighing and measuring devices used in the facility are accurate and meet established specifications. This requirement that mean, would mean that an inspection and testing of those same devices by the Division of Consumer Equitability would be duplicative and therefore an exemption of these devices would be appropriate. These concerns were brought up when the bill was heard in the Senate, but due to timing issues, were not able to be resolved in the Senate prior to certain deadline. deadlines. We very much appreciate your committee requesting the preparation of this mock-up for today's hearing. Mr. Chairman, I believe the language in the bill is introduced and in the mock-up is fairly straightforward. I'm prepared to walk through each section of the mock-up, but I know that the committee's time is limited and you have other items on your agenda today. So I would defer to you as if, as if you want me to do so or not. I would, however, note that section nine newly grants authority to the state sealer of consumer equitability to establish a fee for the licensing of cannabis weighing and measuring equipment that is required to be inspected and tested by the state sealer of consumer equitability, and that this new fee authority is the reason that the bill carries a two thirds majority vote requirement. Again, Mr. Chairman, I'll take your direction whether you want me to walk through each section or not. And I appreciate the opportunity to present the bill to you today. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Matijevich, for presenting the bill. Uh, I believe in the interest of time, uh, we can uh, skip the walkthrough of the language, especially since uh, it has already been presented initially, and we can go directly to member questions. So with that, I believe Dr. Titus will kick us off. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the question. But actually, after reading the amendment uh, and the correction, it actually answered my questions. I had concerns about the non-commercial establishments weighing their product under testing. So thank you for the question, but it's been answered. Wonderful. Thank you. Members, are there any other questions for the department? Mr. Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did, did I misunderstood you, but you have two types of scales, uh, weighing measurements that you were talking about, and one was for seeds for planting and one was for the actual cannabis. Is that correct, or did I misunderstand that? Mr. Chairman, through you to Assemblyman Ellison, Ms. Matijevich, for the record. Uh, Assemblyman, I apologize if, uh, if my testimony might, might have been confusing. Um, no, really, a, a weighing and measuring device, and, and for the purpose of cannabis establishments, we're primarily talking about scales, um, could be used for, for weighing of, of plants in, in any part of, uh, of its life cycle. Um, really, the difference in this bill is the distinction between whether or not the scale is being used for what is defined as a commercial purpose in statute or whether it's being used for some other purpose. Um, again, it might be an inventory management purpose or uh, determining values that are reported into the seed to sale system, which are not directly related to uh, the sale of the product. It's really more about tracking it through its life cycle. Um, and therefore it doesn't meet our current definition of commercial. So it's that non-commercial purpose um, that normally in the scope of what the state sealer of consumer equitability is concerned about doesn't apply. However, given the nature of cannabis, there are other regulatory agencies that do have a very keen interest in being sure that those devices are accurate. And because we are the agency charged with doing that, uh, we, would, we would be seeking to put that requirement into place for any device that's used in a cannabis establishment with exception of, of those um, in independent cannabis testing laboratories that have been ISO 17025 certified. I hope that helps. Yes, it did, and thank you very much. Thank you, members. Any additional questions? All right, seeing none, thank you again, Administrator Matijevich, for the presentation. With that, I will now open it up to anyone wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 404. We'll start with support here in the room. Welcome, Mr. Adler. Please thank proceed you. whenever you're ready. Hello, Will Adler, representing the Scientists for Consumer Safety. Scientists for Consumer Safety wants to personally thank uh, Ms. Matijevich for working so hard on the amendment to include our concerns with commercial, non-commercial scales, and uh, especially with the laboratory setting, because none of the things that go into a laboratory end up going to consumers ever. Uh, we test it and we destroy it. So that, that works great. And this bill serves a pretty good purpose because everything doesn't need to be accurately weighed, especially the marijuana industry when, you know, things are sold for a pound and a pound is thousand dollars or two thousand dollars per pound of marijuana so it does matter and it is a, a big issue in our industry and we thank uh the the, the seals and measures uh, agency for taking this on thank you very much thank you anybody else wishing to testify in support in the room seeing none broadcast production services do we have anyone wishing to provide testimony in support remotely thank you chair to testify in support on SB 404, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, for those that have just joined us to testify in support on SB 404, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Chair, it seems there are no callers in support at this time. Oh, I apologize, Chair. One just popped up. Caller with the last three digits, 001. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to move again. Hello, it's Bill Curran. It's Bill C-U-R-R-A-N. I call simply to voice my support for the uh, Senate Trait Resolution 10. Uh, I'm a longtime resident of Las Vegas. I've Excuse me, sir. For... I believe you uh, are a little bit early. We are on Senate Bill 404, so we'll be taking testimony on no. the joint resolution shortly. Okay, sorry. No problem. Please stay with us and uh, dial back in once we get to, to that bill. Broadcast, do we have anyone else wishing to provide testimony in support of SB 404? Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to testimony in opposition. We'll start with the room. Seeing none. Uh, broadcast, do we have anyone wishing to provide uh, testimony in opposition remotely? To testify in opposition on SB 404, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, and with that, we'll move to testimony in the neutral position on SB 404, first in the room. Seeing none, broadcast, let's see if we have anyone wishing to provide testimony virtually. To testify in neutral on SB 404, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Matijevic, are there any closing remarks that you'd like to make? Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for the opportunity to present the bill to the committee um, and for scheduling it on a hearing where Senator Segerblum was also present. Nothing like a little extra pressure of having uh, the, the godfather on, on the Zoom when you're doing a bill on cannabis. It's a pleasure to present the, the bill. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, quite, uh, quite the coincidence. And uh, I we appreciate. I was just going to say we appreciate all of the department's efforts on weeds, noxious and otherwise. So with that, uh, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 404. And let's see. We're actually going to take a quick one minute recess while we figure out who's next in the queue here. All right, we're back, members. Uh, with that, we are now going to move on to SJR 12, which expresses the priority of the timely completion of the 
Tahoe East Shore Trail Extension Project and urges Congress to provide federal funding for completion of the project. I'm going to open the hearing on SJR 12. I believe we have Mr. Lawrence joining us with DCNR, and I would ask him to kick off the, the presentation whenever you're ready, sir. Um, terrific. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so good afternoon, Chair Watts and members of the committee. For the record, I am Jim Lawrence. I serve as the Deputy Director of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. I also represent the department on the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency governing body. Um, before I get into the testimony, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the resolution. I'd also like to thank the Legislative Committee for the review and oversight of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and the Marlette Lake Water System for supporting this legislation and for all the time and work they spent dedicated to Lake Tahoe issues over the interim. Um, SGR 12, it expresses support and prioritization of the timely completion of the Tahoe East Shore Trail Extension Project and urges Congress to provide federal funding for completion of the project. Lake Tahoe is renowned for its natural beauty and spectacular recreational opportunities drawing visitors from nearby metropolitan areas, from across the nation and from around the world. Lake Tahoe's recreational opportunities support a $5 billion tourism and outdoor recreation economy for the region. But that comes with challenges. The challenge of balancing a sustainable outdoor recreation economy while protecting the environment, visitor experience, and the quality of life of residents is one of the greatest challenges facing the Lake Tahoe Basin today. Perhaps the largest transportation and recreation management challenge on the Nevada side of the Tahoe Basin is along the State Route 28 Highway Corridor. This is commonly referred to as the East Shore. And this, um, this area, it's an 11 mile stretch of highway that at the South Point, um, if you're familiar with the Tahoe Basin, is really Spooner Summits, which is the intersection of Highway 28 and Highway 50. And the north, um, north point of the corridor is basically at Highway 28 and Lakeshore Boulevard at Incline Village. This 11 mile highway stretch experiences peak congestion during the summer months as this corridor provides access to several of Lake Tahoe's most popular beaches, including Sand Harbor at Lake Tahoe Nevada State Park. Traffic congestion is an everyday common occurrence along this corridor as vehicles attempt to find parking along the highway shoulder and pedestrians walk along the highway carrying coolers and strollers to gain access to the beaches. Weekday commuters often experience lengthy delays and waiting in traffic due to the line of cars waiting to enter Sand Harbor State Park when it opens in the morning. In addition, the speech access um, challenges in transportation, it's environmental challenges with the erosion that's created with all of off shoulder parking, as, as well as um, a lot of the social trails and the non-management of having a good sustainable recreation system. In recreation, in recognition of the transportation challenges along the East Shore, 13 stakeholder groups, stakeholder agencies and groups adopted what's called the State Route 28 National Scenic Byway Corridor Management Plan. And this was adopted in 2013. This is a complete corridor management plan that includes the Tahoe East Shore Trail, which will run the entire length of the corridor, and includes parking nodes and also shuttle services to move people along the highway to the beach recreation destinations so they don't have to walk on the shoulder. Some of the SR 28 corridor management plan improvements have been constructed and, and implemented. The first three miles of the Tahoe East Shore Trail, which is a shared use path from Incline Village to Sand Harbor, has been completed along with the necessary trailhead parking. Um, this is a phenomenal trail, and if any of you have the opportunity to go to visit this and use this trail, I, I highly recommend it. It's probably one of the only few places I can think of in the basin where you can walk along and parallel to the lake for a three-mile stretch that's largely flat and level, so, so different generations and different user groups can use it. Um, we also have the Division of State Parks recently issued a request for proposal for a statewide reservation system that will include day use reservations at Sand Harbor to help alleviate the traffic lines when the park opens. Although some progress has been made, the full transportation and environmental benefits cannot be realized until the Tahoe East Shore Trail is completed, along with the parking components that goes along with it. Most of the remaining trail segments and parking node areas are on land managed by the U.S. Forest Service. 
Passage of SJR 12 demonstrates Nevada's commitment to completion of the East Shore Trail, while recognizing that Nevada cannot complete this critical project alone and that a commitment is needed from our federal partners. Um, I would also add, um, I do serve on the Tall Regional Planning Agency Governing Board, and this afternoon, the um, Governing Board unanimously adopted the Regional Transportation Plan. This project is seen as one of the key priorities in achieving some of the transportation benefits we're looking for in the basin. So this concludes my testimony. I really appreciate your time this afternoon, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Lawrence. I had the opportunity to uh, to go along the East Shore Trail probably a couple of weeks ago, and it is uh, it is truly impressive and an excellent resource um, that I encourage anyone who's up here to try and try and check out. And very much looking forward to the expansion of of that trail and. Uh, uh, I think there's also the vision of eventually having a trail that uh, a multi-use trail that goes around the entire lake. Um, there's, a, I think, a lot that goes into that, but it would be, um, I think, an excellent complement to the experiences that are available uh, within the area. So thank you, members. Do we have any questions for Mr. Lawrence? Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, it's it's just to echo your comments. Um, I am honored to serve in Assembly District 30, so I get the chance to drive up to Tahoe often. And that East Shore Trail has been my refugee or my uh, where I go to get my mind cleared the last year and a half. So I really appreciate the work that your group has gone in to make sure that this is a reality. Um, are the plans someplace present for people to take a look at for the long-term goals? Uh, but again, really, it was more so I could get a chance to tell you how much I enjoy the, the actual uh, walk. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Chair Watts, to you and for you to Assemblywoman Anderson. Um, first, thank you both for the for the compliments on the trail. A lot of a lot of stakeholders went into the short trail that first three miles and it is extremely popular and it's wonderful to hear, hear it being used. Um, there is uh, on the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency website and I believe on the Tahoe Transportation District website, there is the State Route 28 Corridor Management Plan. <clears throat> this is really a planning and guidance document um, and it is available and I can make sure that the committee members have the link or get a copy of the plan um, and I will send that over. The engineering and design work has just begun for some of the next trail segments. If you've walked the East Shore Trail, um, not only is it just a, a great experience, but um, it, it's for me, I, I look at some of the engineering challenges because it is along the lake. And because of that, um, <clears throat> there is a certain amount of engineering and design that needs to go into these projects. So the engineering and design for the next phases are underway environmental document is out uh, that the Forest Service released. Um, so we are making substantial progress. Funding is always going to be a challenge though. I hope that answers your question. It did. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I believe Assemblyman Ellison has a question. Thank you. God, I, I really thought you guys made enough money on them bumper stickers to, to build a freeway around it. Every place I look, there's a bumper sticker. Uh, but one of the questions I do have is, are you guys looking to, to restrict any of the road access or strictly just focus right now on trails? And thank you for the question. Um, you know, Chair Watts, to you and through you to Assemblyman Ellison. There, <clears throat> When you mentioned restricting road access, there, there's nothing in the 28 corridor management plan that restricts road access. The biggest challenge that we have along this East Shore stretch is basically parking along the road shoulder. Um, and it's a very dangerous situation, uh, particularly in the summertime. And so there is the goal of eliminating the shoulder parking so that we can have a safer experience for the visitors, but also take care of the erosion problems that the parking causes, and then building parking nodes 
along the corridor so that either a shuttle could take people to the various trailheads or they could walk along the East Shore Trail, which will be parallel to the highway for the most part to get to their trailhead. So um, in, in short, there's no road access restricted, but the goal is to restrict and limit um, shoulder parking, but replace that shoulder, shoulder parking with parking nodes. A couple of years ago when I was up there, I, I see him doing a lot of repairs to the shoulders and it, it seemed like they might be able to to widen them roads by moving it back just a hair and then building a wall, you know, there that they could move the traffic through a little bit. But I, I understand where you're saying the parking sometime can get kind of crazy going through there. But I think everybody wants to go see the lake. It's beautiful, even if it's just driving around it. Uh, I think it's a, a, a palace of its own just to, just to go around it without even stopping. But might be something to look in the future to see if you can maybe widen that just a hair and, and put in the uh, uh, the barrier walls on the back side and, and that might help a little bit on the erosion uh, as they go thank you thank you um, yeah thank you uh, chair wants to you and go ahead, I, I don't Mr. know Lawrence. Shelley um thank you yeah Sullivan Ellison um, great comment, great question. It is certainly part of the mix. The challenge in the Tahoe Basin is, is it is a basin. Um, everything flows down to Lake Tahoe. Um, and particularly on the Nevada side, the topography really constrains um, how much roads can be built or widened. Um, but it's certainly something that is looked at in the mix when all of these projects are being evaluated, is, is how do we achieve our environmental goals um, without creating any environmental damage. I, I appreciate the comment and the question. Thank you. I believe we have a question from Vice Chair Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Um, you know, I was just thinking about something that didn't come to mind when I first read through this, but uh, can you please address with the, with the um, plan what, uh, what's included in the plan for accessibility for um, people with physical disabilities and and maybe not even physical disabilities but just some some inability to um, get around uh, easily Um, thank you, Chair Watts, to you and through you to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you for the question. Um, that question actually um, highlights one of my favorite things about the East Shore Trail. Um, I, I've been blessed and fortunate to be working um, for the state of Nevada for over 20 years now and working in the Tahoe Basin on issues for going on 30. I've raised my child who's now down at UNLV um, in this area. And why I'm bringing this up is I've been recreating up in Lake Tahoe with folks with different types of abilities and different generations. And that is a challenge in Tahoe, again, because of the topography and just the way it's laid out. It's a beautiful place, but a lot of the hikes, you know, you either go straight down or you go straight up. Um, what I love about the East Shore Trail is the what is built now, it's three miles. It's a wide multi-use path. So um, it can accommodate bicycles or scooters and obviously pedestrians, but it is built to standards that different age groups and folks with different capabilities um, can use and enjoy that trail. And I don't know of anywhere else in the Tahoe Basin where you can be that close to the lake for that long. I mean, it's just a wonderful experience. Um, anyway, the rest of the trail, um, it's anticipated as it goes through an engineering design will um, take all of those things into account um, to make sure that it is accessible to different types of user groups with different types of abilities. Thank you. And and um, if I follow up quick, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And then just so, and I'm assuming the parking will also include um, those considerations. Yes, thank you. Um, Yes, whenever developing the parking lots and parking things, those types of considerations need to 
taken place, as well as um, you know potential drop-off spots if those are necessary as well. But you know, again, that is one of the you know one of the shining lights of, of the Tahoe Shore Trail is that it is one of the few places that can become accessible to different user groups. Thank you. Thank you, and we do have our other presenter for the resolution available. So, Assemblywoman Peters, if you'd like to uh, to add some comments, feel free to proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Sarah Peters. For the record, um, I am glad you guys got started. This is a relatively straightforward build, just continuing on with a project that has already been implemented in some areas of the lake, um, and expressing our support. The, the legislature's support of continuing that development on to the other portions of that phased um, that phased build out. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to bring to your attention. We are waiting patiently shovel ready project for federal funding. And our hope with this resolution is to encourage our federal delegates to, um, to build that into some of their budgets. And we know upcoming budgets will involve infrastructure and this is a really great way of including outdoor recreation opportunities, con uh, reducing congestion in the lake area, and getting those infrastructure dollars into the state of Nevada. We also have an obligation at um, Tahoe to be a partner with our other supporting agencies of the region. And this build out has been a huge part of how we've participated in that partnership, ensuring that all people have access to the beauty that is Lake Tahoe while taking care of those resources. I do not know, and I apologize, if um, uh, Mr. Lawrence went over, sorry, I was having a brain fog moment about last names, wanted to make sure I said the right one out loud, um, went over that we also have talked to the Inclined Village General Improvement District about their um, pipeline. There's a wastewater pipeline that is run under the road on Highway 28 there. Um, and this, uh, this East Shore Trail project gives us an opportunity to leverage resources to build in the, the replacement pipeline for that wastewater line without having to disturb the traffic of the highway. And that's a really great way to leverage resources in a time when we know things are kind of tight and we also want to make sure we're not creating too much stress on the natural resources that support our infrastructure around the lake. We know that that has historically been a problem with erosional issues and um, increased turbidity to the lake. So um, I just wanted to point that out as well. Are there any questions based on what, what I have just brought to the attention of the committee? Thank you very much, Assemblywoman Peters. Uh, any additional questions from members? And you did serve on the uh, the interim committee, is that correct? I did. I had the pleasure of um, being the vice chair of the interim committee for the very long name of <laughs> the oversight of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and Marlette Lake Water System <laughs> Board. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Assemblywoman Peters and Mr. Lawrence, for bringing this forward. Uh, with that, we will now move on to testimony. We'll begin with testimony in support of SJR 12. We'll start with folks in the room. It looks like we do have someone. Welcome. Please proceed whenever you're ready. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Emily Walsh, E-M-I-L-Y-W-A-L-S-H, and I appear today on behalf of the League to Save Lake Tahoe in support of SJR 12. The bill presenters have done an excellent job of discussing the outcomes and the process of the State Route 28 Corridor Management Plan. The East Shore Trail has already become the crown jewel of the trail system in Lake Tahoe, in the, the basin entirely, and it's a great alternative to having to experience the beauty of this area through or with an automobile, um, especially on the east side of the lake, which has really uh, been just a complete improvement with this uh, project. We support all efforts to complete this trail. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Seeing nobody else in the room, broadcast, uh, let's see if we have anyone wishing to provide support testimony on SJR 12 remotely. Thank you, Chair. 
To testify in support on SJR 12, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll move to testimony in opposition. First in the room, seeing none, broadcast. Can we see if we have anyone in the queue for opposition on SJR 12? To testify in opposition on SJR 12, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, and with that, we'll move to neutral testimony. First in the room, seeing none, broadcast. Let's see if we have anyone remotely. To testify in neutral on SJR 12, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. With that, uh, Assemblywoman Peters or Mr. Lawrence, any closing remarks that you'd like to make? Seeing none here, Mr. Lawrence, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Um, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just thank you for the opportunity. I um, appreciate the, the time and attention this afternoon. Thank you very much for bringing this measure forward. With that, I'll close the hearing on SJR 12. And we will open the hearing on SJR 10, which urges Congress to protect the public lands, including and adjacent to Sunrise Mountain, Frenchman Mountain, and Rainbow Gardens. Uh, welcome to the Committee on Natural Resources, Senator Orenshaw. You may begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chairman Watts, members of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources, Agriculture, and Mining. Uh, James Orenshaw, State Senate District 21. It's really a pleasure to be here. I had the uh, honor of serving on this committee uh, many, many years ago uh, with uh, former, former Chairman Jerry Claiborne, who was a, a wonderful, wonderful legislator and a, a devoted uh, family man and friend of organized labor and a representative of an area near Sunrise Mountain and Frenchman Mountain. And I have to think that uh, if, if Jerry's watching, he'd be supportive of this resolution. Uh, many people you know, who haven't had a chance to go hiking or uh, try to climb up Frenchman Mountain, Rainbow Mountain, or uh, do a, some of the off-road activities in Rainbow Gardens, don't really know what a, what a gem and what a treasure we have uh, between Lake Mead and the urban Las Vegas Valley and Henderson. And it's a treasure that, that needs to be protected. We've got uh, the, the gypsum cave there, which uh, has tremendous archaeological significance, uh, paleontolo paleontological significance. In fact, uh, my colleague, Senator Hansen, lent me a copy of Dr. Harrington's book on Gypsum Cave that was published in 1933 uh, about his research there, where he found uh, some amazing examples of prehistoric animals and evidence of human life in that cave there on Frenchman Mountain. And uh, Senator Hansen was very kind enough to lend me this book. And if anyone wants to look at it, I'll, I'll leave it here. If anyone wants to look through it, it's very, very cool and antique and details his research there at the Gypsum Cave on Frenchman Mountain. Uh, there's an archaeological site called the Great Unconformity there that, as far as I know, uh, you can only see in one other part of the planet and other than Frenchman Mountain. So it's a, a tremendous resource. Uh, b before I get into too much detail, uh, Mr. Chair, I was assisted on this legislation from the very beginning by an intern from the University of Nevada, Reno, Political Science Department, Charles Olander, who would like to speak briefly to the bill with your permission. And then on Zoom, we've got Clark County Commissioner Tick Sagerblum, Dr. Steve Rowland, uh, Mike Dias, and I hope Helen Mortensen, who have all been very active on this legislation. So with your permission, Chair, if I could turn it over to Charles Olander and then to the presenters on Zoom and then I'm happy to answer any questions. That sounds good. Thank you very much for the introduction, Senator, and welcome back to the Committee on Natural Resources. Good to be here, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Orenshaw, and thank you, Chair and Committee members for allowing me the opportunity to help present this bill today. 
Um, uh, for the record, I'm Charles Olander. I'm a senior studying political science and international affairs at the University of Nevada, Reno. I'm a member of the university's legislative internship program with the honor of working with Senator Orangeshell, and I'm an Eagle Scout out of Troop 550 from Rescue California. Um, it's my pleasure to help present Senate Joint Resolution 10, which urges Congress to protect the public lands, including and adjacent to Sunrise Mountain, Frenchman Mountain, and Rainbow Gardens, because I know the recreational and educational value that places Excuse like that. Excuse me, if hold. I can interrupt you, Grove. Can you make sure that your microphone is turned on oh. and that uh, you've got it close enough to your, so that we can get you onto the record and onto the broadcast? Light on muted or unmuted? There we go. All right, is that better? Yes. All right. Should I repeat? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. For the record, my name is Charles Olander. I'm a senior studying political science and international affairs at the University of Nevada, Reno. I'm a member of the university's legislative internship program working with Senator Orangeshall. And I'm an Eagle Scout from Troop 550 out of Rescue California. It's my pleasure to help present Senate Joint Resolution 10, which urges Congress to protect the public lands, including and adjacent to Sunrise Mountain, Frenchman Mountain, and Rainbow Gardens, because I know the recreational and educational value that places like that hold. As a Boy Scout, I had the opportunity to camp, hike, and backpack all over. The difference between protected areas and unprotected areas can be striking. The difference between a great trip and a bad trip can come down to things like well-groomed trails, litter-free destinations, and well-taken-care-of bathrooms and other facilities. The Frenchman and Sunrise Mountain areas deserve those protections because they hold immense recreational and educational value that local Las Vegas communities and tourists alike deserve to enjoy. Before I hand the presentation off to our experts, I would like to tell you about some of the experiences I've had in similar places with the Boy Scouts uh, to illustrate the potential that this area has. First, uh, when I was in the Boy Scouts, uh, every year we would go to Camp Winton on the Bear River Reservoir. And for the new campers, you would had the opportunity to go into a night hike about half a mile out of camp to a small cave. In this cave, there were about a dozen or so Native American petroglyphs. The leaders of the hike would get a chance to teach new campers about Native American history, local animals, and how the area has changed over time. This little cave was a lot like Gypsum Cave, referenced in SJR 10. With the proper care, the area could offer young Nevadans and out-of-state visitors the same invaluable learning experiences I had as a Boy Scout. Protected areas aren't just good for teaching young people about science and history. They simply make every experience better. Another, tro another trip my troop would go on was to Pinnacles National Monument, now a national park since the last time I visited. Being a national monument, it was well protected and the well-groomed trails, maintained campsites, and well-maintained facilities were crucial for teaching young campers skills like backpacking, uh, that sort of thing. No one wants to walk a trail or stay in a campsite littered with glass bottles or defaced with graffiti. The areas covered in SJR 10 also have immense scientific value. Gypsum Cave was once home to humans and now extinct mammals like the ground sloth uh, covered in the book Senator Orangeshell brought uh, and offers invaluable resources for understanding an ancient ecosystem. Similarly, the Great Unconformity offers geologists the opportunity to, st to, d to study a rather unique case. At the Great Unconformity, rock that is 1.7 billion years old borders rock that's much newer, a youthful 520 million years old. That 1.2 billion year gap represents over a quarter of the Earth's life. While unconformities of a few hundred million years are not particularly rare, these so-called great unconformities can only be witnessed in just a few places in the entire world. Unfortunately, all of the signs along the trail to the great unconformity have been vandalized. In conclusion, Protecting valuable recreational areas like Frenchman's Mountain, Sunrise Mountain, Gypsum Cave, and the Great Unconformity is essential to guaranteeing that generations of Nevadans get to enjoy the natural beauty and recreational and scientific value that they offer. Thank you. Thank you. And we can move on to the next presenter. Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure if that's if that's me or not. This is Tick Sagerbloom. Mr. Chair, yes, if that would be okay. Commissioner Sagerbloom is down in Clark County on Zoom. Then we have Dr. Steve Rowland, um, Helen Mortensen, and Mike Dias. Great. Thank you, Senator, and welcome, Commissioner. It's good to see you. Please proceed whenever you're ready. Good to see you, and um, if the Republicans will hold their ears, I want to say I'm so proud of what you guys are doing this year. You're just, you're on fire. It's fantastic. Best session in history, so keep it up. And also, Cadence, I want to thank you for the, I think it was a compliment, I'm not sure, but I think it was. Um, 
and also uh, four of you uh, actually are, are in my district. Your districts overlap my district. So thank you so much for, for working together with me. Um, I'll be real simple. You know, the west part of our, uh, I mean, the east part of Las Vegas Valley uh, needs an, a park. Uh, you know, Red Rock, everybody in the, in the west part of Las Vegas goes to Red Rock. Um, it's a great place to be. But the fact is, we shouldn't have to drive all the way from East Las Vegas all the way to the west part of the valley just to experience a great natural wonder. And that's what we have right here. Um, the great unconformity is is truly unique, as it was mentioned. Um, it, it fits perfectly with our master plan for the east part of the valley. Uh, it would make a great addition. And so anything you can do to support this um, going forward, hopefully the county and the state can work together to make sure there's money to, to really build this out. But in the meantime, let's get it protected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. With that, we'll go on to the next co-presenter. And I'm, I'm Stephen Rowland, S-E-P-H-E-N, R-O-W-L-A-N-D. And thank you to uh, Chair Watson, especially to Senator Orenshaw for introducing this legislation to, to, to raise the protective status of the Frenchman Rainbow Gardens area. I, I've I was a, been a professor at UNLV for 40 years and I've worked taking students out on field trips and done my own research out in this area for, for, for four decades and it's just spectacular. And I'm gonna show just a few images so you can uh, see what this area looks like. Let's see if I can get this up. So here, here's, here's French from Mountain from Las Vegas side, commonly mistakenly called Sunrise Mountain. There is a Sunrise Mountain. It's over to the north. There's Google image and then Rainbow Garden off to the east. This is a Google Earth image showing this area and this shows the boundary. So this area is about 44,000 acres bounded on the north by Nellis Air Force Base and on the, on the east um, by Lake Mead and on the south by Clark County Wetlands Park. It's just spectacular country, um, geologically and scenically and archeologically. Here's an aerial shot just showing the, the area called Rainbow Gardens, perfectly beautifully named for these curved colorful ridges. Uh, this is Lava Butte, uh, one of the more scenic uh, spectacular features. Here's Lava Butte from the other side looking northwest. Um, this is a, a 15 million year old volcano um, that is exposed right there. So the geological features in the Rainbow Gardens, French Mountain area are, are really unparalleled. And that's gonna sound hyperbolic, but literally there's nowhere else in the world that has the, the spectacular geology exposed, so easily exposed as in the French Mountain Rainbow Gardens area. Uh, Grand Canyon geology stops at the top of that blue layer in the middle of the picture there. And, and French Mountain Rainbow Gardens continue continues to several tens of millions of years of rock, uh, which are just not even exposed in the Grand Canyon. It's, this is really national park world-class geology. Um, we've talked about the Great Unconformity already, um, where we have half a billion year old sandstones lying on top of 1.7 billion year old granite and shit. So this is a wonderful place for outdoor education. I've taken Cub Scout groups there and talked just Explain to them the difference between sedimentary and igneous and metamorphic rocks. And I've taken graduate students in geology there and talked about isotope geochemistry. So there's just a, a, a tremendous range of opportunities for outdoor education uh, that are that are being squandered. Uh, our, our group, um, I'm president of a group called Citizens for Active Management of the Sunrise Frenchman Mountain Area. We work collaboratively with the BLM back in the 90s. Uh, to set up an interpretive site. Here, here's the dedication in February of 1995, 26 years ago, where Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt um, helped dedicate this site. Here's a young Senator Harry Reid at that site ad admiring the 24 by 48 inch stone granite stone panel that, that explains the geology of that region. It ended badly. Uh, vandalism could not be controlled. And finally, those that, that 24 by 48 inch panel that Senator Reed was admiring a few slides ago um, had to be removed because BLM just did not have the law enforcement bandwidth 
uh, to protect it. Uh, up on top of the ridge nearby, a short hike away, we had another interpretive panel that overlooked Las Vegas Valley, similarly with geologic interpretive messages. It was partly um, constructed with the help of the Boy Scouts who helped carry some of these materials up there. Uh, it was destroyed by vandalism. Um, so this area, the, the, the trail that went up to that hill uh, with the interpretive signs were destroyed by vandals. Uh, Vandalism and graffiti are continue to be an ongoing problem there and BLM just does not have the manpower to, to pr protect it and patrol it. So this area um, is just a jewel waiting to be enjoyed by, by, by Las Vegans and people from outside the, the country, outside the city. Uh, I have a friend who teaches geology in Norway who brings his students here to visit this area. Um, it just needs a higher level of protective status and, and uh, uh, Senator Orenshaw's bill would be a, an important first step in that direction. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go on to the next presenter. All right, you're on. Hi, I'm Helen Mortensen. I am the secretary treasurer for the Citizens for Active Management Frenchman Sunrise Mountain Area. We were organized in 1993. We're a nonprofit organization. And our um, motto is, would you like another outdoor recreation area? I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's our brochure. And uh, with uh, Tom, Senator Tom Hickey was our first president and he's greeting the Las Vegas bear ball poppy in front of Gypsum Cave. I appreciate the comments that Orange, Senator Orenshaw made about Gypsum Cave, because it's extremely important to include this in the 44,000 acre site of the Frenchman Sunrise Mountain, Gypsum Cave area, Rainbow Gardens also. But what is so important about the Gypsum Cave, and I have also the publication eight from Southern uh, Southwest Museum. But what's important is what they discovered, what Herring discovered in that cave was Ice Age animals, Ice Age horse, Ice Age camel, and Ice Age sloth that everybody knows about. But what they also, what Harrington included, were these painted adult, adult darts, extremely important native um, artifacts. Also three flutes, three Native American flutes. But these painted artifacts leads to the research that Ann Dubarton from the Desert Research Institute um, and Keith Meyer from the Nellis Air Force Base, he was formerly with BLM, now with, uh, was with the Nellis Air Force Base and Tish LaPierre went to Pintwater Cave 65 miles northwest of Gypsum Cave, and they found exactly the same painted darts with the same patterns on them. That's extremely important for our new Thule Spring site, that this connection between Gypsum Cave and the new Thule Spring site. When um, Harrington uh, finished his uh, work and everything with Gypsum Cave, he also worked on 1962, the Pleistocene studies in Southern Nevada. Shuttler, our state museum manager was a publication of this. What happened was in 1962, Willard Libby wanted to do the, um, the um, um, carbon dating and he wanted some place to test that. So he gathered a whole bunch of scientists together and he decided that this area, this area in our valley would be the project head. So they all gathered together in 1962. And with that, they included Gypsum Cave as a reference on page 147, right here. Gypsum Cave is pointed on as a important part of the Thule Springs. Also during that, National Geographic thought there was going to be a big explosion about the early Americans I mean, and they came and they took 6,000 photographs. Well, that all kind of went 
to, to sleep for a little while until National Geographic came out, December issue 2000, 2000. And in that issue, they have a map called Peopling the Americas. And I have a bigger one here, but I don't think I can show it to you. But believe it or not, Tule Springs was on this map. So that really set us off. We had a reunion in 2002 for all the scientists that worked on the two, uh, 1962 project and everything. And we had really starting again about getting um, designations and, and so forth and uh, to get this place saved and so forth. So at any rate, we, um, with the um, event again came up in 2007 was the Adventure Magazine by National Geographic. Here we all right here, like that. And what you know, we are the number one adventure city in the United States. And why, and why this, this whole area is so important to develop. The reason we are number one is because of this page. It's a map showing all the national parks, Grand Canyon, Zion, Bryce, Death Valley, Las Vegas is center point. This is a huge industry for our state to get tourism here that will stay here, thanks to National Geographic. And so it's really, really important that Gypsum Cave, the Great Unconformity, and everything be protected. It is a really sad thing. In 2019, Outdoor Nevada paired up with the REI. REI paid for service for people to come and help clean up the Great Unconformity area, which was a huge trash pile. People took off for work because they were paid to actually to come here and help clean it up. Over 100 people showed up from Colorado, Arizona, and um, um, California. I'm sorry, it was Utah and Arizona, California and Nevada. We had a huge turnout. It was extremely successful, but it's all back like it was again. We've had MS uh, killings out there. We've had burnt cars out there. It's just no control of this place. We need someone bigger to help preserve this, like the National Park Service, we need this whole area put aside, like we've done with the B uh, with the BLM has done a fantastic job with the Red Rock, but we need much more power. Red Rock is stretched to the zillions with the, um, their their projects and everything. They really only visit this area about twice a month, if they get a chance to do that. And they don't have the money, the staff, or the power. When we organized the Citizens for Active Management, why did we organize? Tom Hickey gave out a call. He said, you know what? My backyard, which he meant the 44,000 acres, including Frenchman's Mountain, Gypsum Cave, and a, is a shooting range. People are going out there shooting the insulators off of the power poles. So Nevada Power got involved. We got, uh, and trash dumping, we got the Silver State services involved. And they and they actually patrolled the area and monitored it. And we got it a little bit under control. And then we had the dedication of the monument. We thought, boy, we're really doing well. In fact, um, the uh, 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 Hickey, Lillian Hickey School and the Bob Bailey Middle School won awards. And we went with them back to Washington to take Pride in America Award. We thought we were really doing good, but it, but it was BLM's responsibility to keep it going and pipe. But there's no way to protect it without some bigger person or entity helping it. The people at the National Park Service with Lake Mead, everything right there, they're right on the border of Virginia. If they could take over managing the property with everything. That would be so wonderful. And I really praise the new Secretary of Interior as a Native American. We've got the Gypsum Cave. We also have one of the prominent things about Gypsum Cave is the Salt Song Trail. And I know you probably can't see this, but 
Gypsum Cave actually is one of the destinations of four different states, Kimwabi, Ute, all these Native Americans come to Gypsum Cave for their events, what they want to do. And so I presented the poster to uh, Kenny Anderson, chairman of the N Southern Nevada Paiutes, a, a cultural chairman of the, and his committee. And I said, what, what would you like to do? You got another power line coming in through here. And he said, well, we would like to have uh, maybe a caretaker's cottage out there. We would like to be responsible for it. Gypsum Cave has not gone uh, unscathed either. We, uh, a group of uh, Arco Nevada members went in there with permission of BLM to the cave. By the way, the BLM said, we don't go into the cave. So they wanted us to take pictures of the debris. There was graffiti on the wall. I mean, a, like a huge Amazon mask or something over where the camel was found. There was chips off of, of, of the selenite all over. The place was trashed with beer cans and everything. It's a party place for people to go. And there's no, no, um, no, um, um, of control over it. We are working with the Nellis Air Force Base. Kish Lapierre has a marvelous group that meets twice a year with the Native Americans. They have caves and rock shelters on Nellis Air Force land that borders the Gypsum Cave area. Dr. Rafferty sent one of his students, Lynn Hansenbuehler, out to document what was on our side. Thank you, Miss Martinson. If you could uh, start to wrap up your remarks so that we can. Uh move That's to the it. last presenter and any questions thank you. thank you so much for sharing all of that with us senator do we have another presenter or uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, James Orenshaw, State Senate District 21. I believe uh, Mike Dias, former, uh, he's a resident of the area, uh, architect, former chairman of the Sunrise Manor Town Board, been active in trying to protect and preserve that area for many, many years. Mr. Dias, please proceed. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Oh, we cannot hear you right now. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee members, Michael Dias, D-I-A-S. I thank you very much for allowing me to speak regarding this important matter. I am not a scientist, but I have lived in Sunrise Manor at the base of Frenchman's Mountain for over 46 years. For 30 of those years, I was a member of the Sunrise Manor Town Advisory Board. I have hiked up the west side of Frenchman's Mountain as far as I could, and I was amazed at all living things uh, that were up there. There were acres of the largest barrel cactus I've ever seen. I saw desert tortoises eating the vegetation. One night, I saw a two foot tall owl on my backyard railing. It was truly a once in a lifetime thrill. <clears throat> on the east side of Frenchman's Mountain in Rainbow Gardens, I drove on the service road from the very south end of Hollywood Boulevard north to get to North Lake Mead Boulevard. It was truly an eye-opening experience. The rock formations and the multicolors of all of the rock rival red rock and deserve the same protection as been mentioned then there's the great unconformity this is truly a unique feature on the side of the mountain in 96 i did attend senator reed's dedication as did mrs mortensen of the monument for the great unconformity and was so disheartened 
a year later to see that it was destroyed by the graffiti and the gunshots. As you have seen the pictures, the whole area was a mess with broken glass and litter. It is so disappointing. <clears throat> this whole area as described needs and deserves to be protected for future generations to allow them to enjoy this area as much as I have. With the wild growth this valley has experienced over the past 40 years, we need to protect all of our natural wonders. I'd like to thank Senator Orrin Chaw and the rest of the sponsors for this bill and for their forward thinking regarding this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, with that, does that conclude the, your presentation, Senator? Yes, Chairman, and thank you very much for your indulgence. I have some very passionate uh, people who've been working a long time on this legislation. Thank you for your indulgence. Oh, of course, and I'll take a, just a quick moment of personal privilege as the chair to note that uh, I grew up in the east part of town um, looking at Frenchman Mountain constantly as, as a kid and uh, went and visited the unconformity on a geology trip when I was at UNLV for a class I was taking and have also hiked up the uh, the road to the the tower road to the top of Frenchman is is quite a slog but the view of Rainbow Gardens uh, from from the top is is pretty magnificent I think I even saw uh, a lunar eclipse from uh, down near the base of Frenchman so it's a place that I think uh, holds a lot of significance to many of us in Southern Nevada, including myself. So appreciate all of the, the passion and expertise brought to the presentation. Uh, with that, we will open it up to questions from members. And uh, uh, Senator, if you can help direct traffic and make sure that we get get an answer from the best person and get one, one answer per question so that we can keep things moving, I'd appreciate that. And we'll start with Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, um, Senator, and all your presenters uh, for this um, resolution today, and, and also the passion that, that I see, and not just a passion today, but a passion that has been there for decades uh, from your presenters, and, they, and they've stayed with it. I have a couple questions, actually. It was mentioned that this is about 44,000 acres, and I did uh, look at a copy of the the map that this is involving and and it's mentioned that the landfill is currently closed is that a private does, who owns that landfill is it a private property uh, chair with uh with your permission i think i'll defer to dr roland i believe the landfill is owned by clark county it is not part of the federal land that blm owns but uh and uh, actually mike dias might have that information as well with his years of serving on the town board so i'll defer to whoever wants to jump in This is Steve Roll, and I think I think Mike Dias might be a better better person to address this, or perhaps uh, Commissioner Sagerbloom. The but reason, uh, the I'm reason not sure for my questioning is is I just worry about um, it, that's closed now. But if it's in private ownership, who owns it? Would they open it up again? Would it have some impact on what? you're talking about so uh, and you can get back to me with that if cer certainly and uh, my my feeling with this bill is that the current federal lands that are managed by the bureau of land management are what i'm hoping that congress would act to try to preserve uh, i have read as to the history of red rock canyon anyone who's had a chance to even drive through red rock canyon even if you didn't get out and hike i think has to know that that's one of the most special places in the united states what I've read, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, people would take old cars, dump them at Red Rock Canyon, and use them for target practice. They'd break bottles, they'd vandalize that area, and it was, uh, had the same problems Sunrise Mountain, French Mountain, Rainbow Gardens have now. Uh, but in the early 1970s, Congress acted and increased protections. And then in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, further increased protections. And, uh, you know, now there's strict rules but there's beautiful maintained paths there's parking lots bathrooms where families can go and enjoy the area and then at nine o'clock or ten o'clock when they close red rock canyon it, it closes and there's not going to be uh, parties or vandalism happening after hours uh, and i think that if that kind of protection were brought to a, a gypsum cave a great unconformity national monument a rainbow gardens national recreation area frenchman mountain national conservation area 
our, our community could enjoy that area, get out and hike and, and enjoy that treasure we have, but it could be protected the way Red Rock Canyon was. The landfill, as far as I know, is not part of the federal public land, so I don't believe this bill would affect that landfill unless somehow the federal government took over that uh, Thank that you. Follow-up follow up question, Mr. Chair. Uh, and also the next, and thank you for that. The next question I had was the, the Paco Gypsum, uh, that's a closed mine at this point in time, is that correct? That no longer functions, or is it still active mining there? Uh, through you, Chair Watts, to Assemblywoman Titus, uh, the Pabco Gypsum mine, I believe, is still active, but I'm not. I'm not 100% sure, so I need to get a little more information and probably get back to you. Do you on know that. if there's any other active mining claims within this area? I, I don't have the answer to that. I can try to find out, but I don't have the answer to that. I did try to find out whether. This area, Frenchman Mountain, Rainbow Garden, Sunrise Mountain, was mentioned in either of the two land bills that are currently pending in the Congress. And the answer I got was that there currently is no mention of increased protection for these areas. But as to the Pabco gypsum mine or the any other mining claims, that I don't have the answer to right now. And I could oh, try okay. to find out. I, I would love to know if there's any other claims in, in this area, knowing that the gypsum is there, if there's any other mining claims filed on this land. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the questions. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Senator. You can also go directly to members moving forward and um, uh, appreciate your willingness to track down any information on other land ownership or uh, mining claims, particularly active mining claims uh, that, that may be in the area. Do we have any other questions from members? All right, seeing none. Thank you again very much, uh, Senator, uh, as well as uh, all of your co-presenters for their thorough presentation. With that, we will now open it up for testimony on SJR 10. We'll begin with anyone in the room wishing to provide testimony and support. Seeing none. Oh, seeing one. Come on up. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Emily Walsh, E-M-I-L-Y-W-A-L-S-H, and I appear today on behalf of the Nevada Concert League, Conservation League in support of SJR 10. Sunrise Mountain, Frenchman Mountain, and Rainbow Gardens are unique and remarkable areas that are worthy of protection and federal designation. These areas are home to historic sites, hold significance for our indigenous communities, and have am ample opportunities for outdoor recreation. Nevada's lands and open spaces have become even more important during the COVID-19 pandemic with families seeking solace in the outdoors for recreational opportunities and healthy benefits, affirming the connection between our land's health and our community's health. It is important that we protect these special spaces so that they're available for future generations and we urge the committee to support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Seeing no one else in the room, I believe we can now go to broadcast to see if we have anybody in support of SJR 10 uh, remotely. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on SJR 10, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits 445, please press star six to unmute. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Watson, committee members. My name is Teresa Crawford, T-E-R-E-S-A-C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D. Um, I'm a volunteer member of the Sierra Club's Legislative Committee and a longtime public lands and outdoors activist. On behalf of the Sierra Club and our more than 40,000 members and supporters statewide, we speak strongly in support of SJR 10. Um, the Frenchman Sunrise and Rainbow Gardens area, after decades of work and heartbreaking desecration, it's time for this area to receive the federal designation it deserves. Um, the highest peak in the Las Vegas Valley, um, uh, globally significant geology, populations of state protected bear paw poppies, and uh, really would like to address 
that the Gypsum Cave is an indigenous site that dates to 3000 BC and remains a place of great religious and cultural significance to the Southern Paiutes. And it's, as I said, heartbreaking to hear of vandalism, desecration, trash, and partying going on in what is really somebody's church. Um, this area is a logical companion to the Tule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument. Uh, someday, I hope, we'll have all of our fossils back in Nevada and uh, wonderful science and research going on. I want to thank all the presenters and uh, Dr. Rowan and uh, Helen Mortensen, who've worked so hard to bring us to this point. Uh, I urge everyone in the committee, uh, this really hopefully will be a unanimous vote in support of SJR 10. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Crawford. We'll go on to the next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits, 377. And please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes. You may begin. Chair Watson, members of the committee, my name is Jane Amone, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N, and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. We are here to voice our support for SJR 10 to protect the public lands, including and adjacent to Sunrise Mountain, Frenchman Mountain, and Rainbow Gardens. These areas are truly special places for many reasons, from the sensitive plant species that live there, to the geologic wonder that is the great unconformity, to the various cultural treasures that tell the story of our own humanity, like Gypsum Cave. We are concerned about threats to this area. Other folks spoke about those threats, so I won't belabor them, but I would like to add that the Nature Conservancy has recently worked to document root proliferation in this area, and we have noticed that illegal motorized root proliferation has gotten worse in recent years. On a personal note, as someone who regularly enjoys our public lands, I appreciate that from the top of Frenchman Mountain, one can see stunning views of the rich palette of colors presented by Rainbow Gardens and the view of Lake Mead beyond. It is truly an amazing place. We appreciate Senator Orenshaw and the bill sponsors for bringing this resolution forward. We urge the committee's support for SJR 10. Thank you so much for hearing our testimony. Thank you very much for your comments, Ms. Moan. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 001. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. Please press star six to unmute, and then you may begin. Caller with the last three digits. Okay, you may begin. Hello, this is Bill Curran. Uh, unlike some of your other uh, uh, witnesses, I am not a member of the uh, uh, environmentalist community per se, although I consider myself to be an environmentalist. Uh, to the contrary, I probably have represented lots of people who are in the development community itself. Uh, I've been in Nevada for nearly 20 years. I've lived in both northern and southern Nevada. I've seen the development of our state in ways that uh, uh, sometimes I would consider to have been unwise. Uh, I think in all, uh, uh, our development has been beneficial to both our state and to our residents. But I want to say that uh, I strongly support this resolution. Um, I have heard the presenters describe it as a jewel, a gem, and a treasure, and I consider that to be what it is. The only point I can add uh, beyond what you've already heard uh, is if you look to the west, to Red Rock, uh, you should be cognizant of the fact that uh, it is under threat. Uh, not only is there long-standing litigation at the southern end of uh, the Red Rock area um, uh, involving the uh, old gypsum mine site, uh, which is scheduled as planned for uh, thousands of new homes. Uh, on the other end, um, uh, in the center of what we consider uh, uh, the Red Rock area is uh, what traditionally has been known as Bonnie Springs. Uh, I'm sure uh, most of you will remember that. You probably took your kids there or went there as kids yourselves. I will tell you that that has now been approved uh, for residential development. Um, a major developer, I'm sure he's going to do a nice job. 
but I don't think anybody uh, would like to have seen that area. Uh, Thank you, sir. If you can begin to wrap up your remarks, please. That, uh, that really wraps them up. Um, I think that this is a uh, rare, unique opportunity to preserve something that can have great significance for our community. Thank you very much for your testimony. Broadcast, can we move, move on to the next caller, please? Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. All right. With that, let's move to testimony in opposition of SJR 10. Seeing none in the room, broadcast, can we see if we have anyone wishing to provide testimony in opposition remotely? To testify in opposition on SJR 10, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. And with that, we'll go to testimony in the neutral position on SJR 10. Seeing none in the room. Broadcast, let's see if we have anybody on the phones. To testify in neutral on SJR 10, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. Uh, with that, Senator, if you'd like to come up and make any closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Watts. Uh, members of the Assembly Natural Resources Committee, James Orange, all Senate 21. Thank you, thank you again for hearing Senate Joint Resolution 10. The idea for this bill actually came out of a conversation I had with uh, our, our late friend, former State Senator Tom Hickey, one night uh, sitting at his kitchen table. And he talked about the idea of trying to, you know, protect this area and make it an area that our our constituents could really enjoy but also have the protections that's a place like Red Rock and Lakeview National Recreation Area have uh, my friend Helen Mortensen has worked tirelessly helping develop the Ice Age Park uh, with um, her late husband Assemblyman Mortensen and Dr. Roland, Mike Dias. I want to thank them. Thank uh, our, you and our intern for helping present the bill. Thank you for hearing it. I know the hour's late. Uh, I hope you'll consider moving forward with this legislation. Thank you very much for bringing this measure forward again, Senator Orenshaw. Good to see you. With that, I will close the hearing on SJR 10. And uh, that leaves one last item on our agenda today, which is public comment. Uh, again, in order to make public comment, you must register in advance. We ask that you limit your remarks to two minutes. Uh, with that broadcast, can we see if we have anybody in the queue wishing to provide public comment? To take your place in the public comment queue, please press star nine now. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no more callers at this time. All right, thank you very much, uh, Broadcast Production Services, for your assistance in allowing uh, folks to participate by, vo by phone and by Zoom in our meeting today. Thank you, members, for your time and attention. Uh, and thank you to all the members of the public who tuned in to today's meeting. Uh, with that, our next meeting will be on Monday, May 3rd. Uh, I believe we have, I think we have three bills on our agenda. Um, and we will be looking at a work session as well. So members, please take a look at uh, the items that are planned for work session uh, on Monday. Uh, thank you everyone again for your attendance. And with that, today's meeting is adjourned.